Okay, so welcome everyone to today's overview webinar for ARC's cross-sectional innovation to improve rural postpartum mental health challenge. Uh, we'll be doing a bit of a deep dive into uh, the content in, uh, of this challenge, the design uh, and the drivers behind it with some subject matter expertise. Then we'll go Bye. into challenge logistics and submission requirements and evaluation criteria. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Priscilla Novak from the Office of the Director at uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Priscilla? Priscilla, it appears that you are muted. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. I just wanted to let you know, um, since we uh, I'm unmuted, I believe. Can folks hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. OK. Um, it seemed to me like the audio was breaking up just a little bit, so I moved closer to my Wi-Fi router. But such are the challenges that we have uh, in these times with a lot of online meetings. But it's a pleasure to be with you today. And I think we can go ahead and get to the next slide. Uh, like Jamie said, we're just gonna talk about a background about postpartum mental health and um, a little overview of the problem itself. And then Jamie will cover the timeline and submission requirements as well as the evaluation criteria and the submission process. So you, you can go ahead and go to the next screen, please. So a little bit about the purpose of the challenge. This challenge was developed to uh, gather stories, narratives, and proposals from the field about solutions to address postpartum mental health diagnosis and treatment in rural communities, with the intent that ARC would subsequently share, if it's a, the story format, share those uh, stories and case studies with healthcare systems, healthcare professionals, local and state policymakers as well as federal partners and uh, the public. So there's two categories in our challenge. One is the success stories for uh, organizations that have undertaken an initiative to improve postpartum mental health in a rural community. They can submit to the success story category. And those highlight community achievements to improve postpartum mental health. And the other category is program proposals that demonstrate innovative planning for community action of a program to improve postpartum mental health. So solutions should highlight successful or promising programmatic interventions to improve postpartum mental health. And they can be submitted by healthcare providers, so offices that serve uh, rural communities, uh, rural hospitals, uh, community-based organizations and clubs that serve rural communities, faith-based groups, um, if there's cooperative extension that's running a type of program to improve postpartum mental health, schools in rural communities, um, I already mentioned hospitals, but of course local health departments and state, territorial, and tribal organizations serving rural communities can all participate in the challenge. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about my background. I'm in the office of the director at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. And our mission is to help make healthcare higher quality, more accessible, more equitable, and safer for all Americans. Um, I've been at ARC, I started there in 2012 um, and currently serve as the lead for ARC's Accelerating Change and Transformation in Organizations and Networks contract mechanism that does field-based projects to improve healthcare safety and quality. As far as my research, my background is in uh, using survey data to identify health disparities among people with serious psychological distress that also have health problems or phys co-occurring physical conditions. So I'm pleased to lead this challenge on behalf of the agency, and we are excited to uh, hear from the field about solutions that are being used to help solve this problem. 
So we can go to the next slide and I'll talk a little bit about the postpartum depression and real postpartum mental health issues. So as I already mentioned, the challenge focuses on postpartum mental health diagnosis and treatment in rural communities. Um, what we know from the literature and from studies that have been done is that rural women and families face barriers in accessing adequate mental health care for postpartum mental health problems. And those include the cost of uh, getting care, it could be transportation, um, the transportation issue might be greater in a rural community, and then also the need to find childcare if you are going to see a, a healthcare professional and um, live in a rural area, it might be difficult to find someone to watch your child while you get the care you need. Additionally, of course, we know that rural communities have uh, often have a shortage of healthcare providers, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And I do have to mention with the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, people are especially uh, feeling a lot of uncertainty, I believe, across the United States. And women who are, are pregnant and who um, are giving birth have a very different set of circumstances that they're going to experience than maybe what they imagined when the pregnancy started. So it's a heightened time of, of concern for people across the United States. And in rural communities, in addition to conditions that might be present um, across the United States, there's also several specific concerns for rural communities. And one part of the issue would be that postpartum mental health problems, um, and I don't think this is specific just to rural communities, but we know that across the board, postpartum mental health problems are diagnosed less frequently than they occur. And part of that is related to cultural norms and of course a lot of stigma that people have about seeking care for mental health issues. Um, there's also research that suggests that there's a disparity in diagnosis and treatment between women with private health insurance and women who have Medicaid insurance. And of course, um, people who are uninsured are the least likely to be diagnosed and treated. And I already mentioned a little bit about the rural areas that experience healthcare workforce shortages. Um, especially, this is an important consideration for the behavioral health workforce. And evidence suggests that rural residents may be undertreated for mental health conditions um, compared to people who are in urban areas. Next slide, please. So the theme is about improving rural postpartum mental health. And I wanted to mention on the prevention front that the United States Preventive Services Task Force provided a report and recommendation about this in 2019. And they did specifically mention two programs um, which they rated as evidence-based. And the links are provided here on this slide. Next slide, please. So we know that there are several reliable and validated screening tools, and those include the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, which is often the most commonly used for postpartum women. Um, there's also a Postpartum Depression Screening Scale. The Patient Health Questionnaire with nine questions is commonly used. The Beck Depression Inventory is another commonly used uh, screener. And there is also the Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale and Zung Self-Rating Depression Scale. But as I mentioned, the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale is one of the most commonly used, and that's because it has questions specific to uh, postpartum women and uh, to assess normal issues that might arise around the arrival of a new baby, including altered sleep schedules and altered mood. Um, which can be common, but it measures the severity in a way that's meaningful to pregnant women. Next slide, please. So I did wanna talk a little bit about the literature about social isolation and postpartum mental health. And there's evidence to support that a lack of social support and uh, 
a sense of social isolation is associated with the development of, of postpartum mental health problems. Women who lack social support may be more likely to have low self-esteem. It may be that their family live at a distance, that they're physically not available, which we know in, in our current circumstances is often the case that people do not feel safe to uh, make visits to friends and family. People are cut off from, from friendships. And also for women in terms of a risk for developing postpartum mental health issues, there's some suggestion that uh, relationship discord can be uh, an issue uh, and increase the risk of developing postpartum mental health issues. Next slide, please. So this challenge is really about hope for solving the problem. And we know that um, while postpartum mental health issues are treatable, many depressed women do not receive care. I already mentioned about stigma because of people historically, there's always been stigma around mental health care. For women in rural areas, there might also be treatment barriers such as uh, inability to afford the care and it could be related to cost sharing or insurance coverage. And of course, um, Health and Human Services has programs to address uh, health, health care workforce shortages. However, in many rural areas, we know that there's still a shortage of providers. So some of the reasons why women struggle to find help uh, have something to do with the way that the healthcare system is set up and the normal roles and treatment patterns that occur across different specialties. So obstetrician and gynecologist physician or uh, nurse midwife or advanced practice nurse that are treating women and basically managing the pregnancy, it may be that they are not comfortable treating the mental health problem. And if that occurs in a location where there's no, there's no uh, mental health provider, it can be difficult for women to find a place to follow up with. Um, of course, in the payment structure, uh, physicians uh, or the OB provider is normally reimbursed at the level of the, the delivery itself. So, usually there's not an additional financial incentive to uh, further reimburse obstetricians or gynecologists or nurse midwives who are working with women who have a mental health problem. Um, for pediatricians, a lot of times, of course, mothers do take their infants uh, and children to pediatricians to get uh, well child care, And that could be a moment in time at which postpartum mental health could be addressed. However, usually pediatricians don't treat the mother, they are treating the child. There's also family medical doctors. Um, a lot of times when women are pregnant, they might cease to see their family medical doctor or their um, usual nurse who provides them care, and they might be going to OB care. Um, and so there could be a period of time where they're not seeing that normal uh, physician or nurse and there's a gap in the continuity of care. So if a woman has a postpartum mental health issue, it might be some care coordination challenges to follow up with uh, the healthcare provider that normally works with them and explain and, and get to the bottom of uh, what's going on and get a diagnosis and get the treatment they need. Of course, we know in terms of financial incentives, um, most of the time for office-based care, many people who provide care to uh, pregnant and reproductive age women are paid by the visit. And also family physicians or many nurses who provide care in an office-based setting do not deliver mental health therapy. And then last, uh, for psychiatrists or psychologists, they typically are not a part of the birth team, and they might not be comfortable with the pregnancy part of postpartum mental health. And we also know that psychiatrists and psychologists are 
paid less than other specialties, and it's often um, one of the critical shortages in rural areas that there are not enough mental health providers. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, so that's the end of my description of the problem that we are trying to solve. And I believe that Jamie is gonna take it over and explain about what we're looking for in terms of submissions and how those submissions will be evaluated. Yes. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Um, very good information. Um, we've had a, a couple of uh, iterations of the same question come in throughout, and I think it's because the, the information here is so uh, useful, and that is whether, um, Access to the links will be provided after the webinar. The answer is yes. Uh, we will provide the slides, uh, all of the slides here on our website in the coming days. Uh, they'll be posted there. Uh, so keep an eye out for those. Um, we did set up this deck for that reason, so that there's a lot of information here for you to come back to and reference as you build your uh, submission. So now we're going to jump into the logistics um, of the challenge. I also like to mention that um, at the bottom of your Zoom uh, pod, if you're logged into the Zoom application, uh, there's a chat box and there's also a Q&A box. If you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A. Um, we have a section of the webinar at the end uh, where we will address those questions. Um, <coughs> sorry, getting, apparently my sound is very, distorted. So I'm going to try to repair my sound quickly. If we could, if we could pause for just one moment, I'm going to repair my sound. Can you all hear me now? Okay. Sorry about that. My apologies. Um, is the uh, hopefully the quality is better. Okay. So uh, sorry about that, everyone. Um, technical issues. Um, so I was mentioning uh, to please use the Q&A pod at the bottom um, of your Zoom application. There's a Q&A pod and a chat pod. Please use Q&A to submit questions uh, so that we can easily see them 
uh, amongst others and mark when they've been answered. We will have a Q&A section at the, um, at the end of this. Uh, so now we're going to get into the timeline and prize structure. So um, total prize structure is $175,000. Um, there, this, this is a one phase challenge with two categories. Uh, so there's the success story category, as Priscilla mentioned, with up uh, to five finalists for $15,000 each, and the program proposal category with up to two finalists for $50,000 each. And so we will um, we'll be going into more detail in just a little bit about what each of those categories means. Um, so the challenge just launched a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're having our first webinar today. There will be subsequent webinars with the content be very similar. Um, the submission deadline is September 15th, um, and the winners will be announced uh, in November 2020. That's the planned date of announcement. So. So now we're going to get into the submission requirements for the success story. So this is a five-page narrative, up to five pages. Um, in the five pages, you should provide a description of the solution and um, the, the, the description of the community. Um, and so that should discuss the rurality of that community. And there are indices out there and resources that um, you can help to you know, quantify the rurality of a given community, uh, and then demographic and health characteristics as well. And then a description of uh, a description of the how barriers were reduced for women and families accessing adequate mental health care. Um, there are barriers listed here. These are the most common barriers: cost, access to care, childcare, stigma. Um, you can feel free to um, list your own barriers as well. We do ask, though, um, for any barrier that you provide and for how your solution is addressing those barriers, that you quantify and qualify that barrier. It will only strengthen uh, your submission to show how you had an impact on that barrier. A description of any of the partners engaged. Um, we know a lot of, of organizations work uh, with others, work with other individuals, work with other healthcare providers. Um, so discuss those partnerships and how they work. Um, and then the uh, I think the bulk of this, which is a description of how the solution meets the needs that the that the challenge seeks to address. Uh, so there are some um, issues and needs shown here again similar to the barriers. If you have examples uh, from your own work that you would like to include, uh, please include them and please cite um, why they are significant uh, so that you can show the impact of your solution. You have the option to submit a video um, and to discuss your solution and, and how it helped uh, with rural postpartum depression. So next we have the submission requirements for the program proposal. Um, very similar, um, the description of the community, uh, including rurality. And we did get a question uh, during the last uh, submission requirements piece about defining rurality. I would normally hold that till the end, but uh, it makes sense here. Um, there are different indices um, used to define rurality. One that I'm familiar with is called the RUCA score, um, R-U-C-A, and it basically provides, at the highest level, it provides a score of rurality um, based on zip code. And you can download a, um, a Excel file where you can match up a zip code and get that rurality score. Um, there is the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy that provides information. Um, Priscilla, did you have any specific resources you wanted to mention? Um, the, def oh. the definition of rurality is based upon the HRSA rural areas. And so if the link is not included here in these slides, we can certainly include it before we send it out to the folks who registered for today. Good point. Yes, we will do that. We will include 
uh, the reference to the HRSA, to the HRSA um, verbality scores. Thank you. So uh, then the description of, of the community's plan to improve postpartum mental health diagnosis and treatment. This is a significant piece of, of the, the application or the submission. Um, how you plan to go after it. And so this is an innovation challenge uh, funded and, and run by ARC. So um, please, you know, please talk about the novelty and how what you're doing will have impact. Um, and then again, uh, on the next item, discuss the barriers and how they will be reduced. Um, and you can include other barriers again. And then a description of your team. This is uh, something that is similar to the success story submission um, where you have partnerships, but talk about the team and include a work plan demonstrating how the team will be managed over the course of the project. Uh, so we'd like to understand that organizational structure, um, how you all will collaborate to reach your goals. And continued on to the next slide, um, this is still the submission requirements for the program proposal. Uh, the, a description of your plan to engage the community. Um, what, you know, you talked about what the community is, now talk about your ties to the community and how you can work with them uh, to improve rural postpartum depression screening and diagnosis. Uh, and then a description of how the plan meets the needs. Again, this is the probably the bulk of the submission, um, how you're going to address those issues uh, that we see so often um, in rural parts of America. Um, you can also have, an, uh, for the program proposal submission type, you can also have uh, an appendix of letters of support from your community partners. Uh, this can be very helpful um, in, in filling any gaps or, or, or showcasing um, anything significant that you'd like to include. And then you may also, for this submission type, have um, a, a video up to five minutes um, and discuss how the plan will help solve the problem. So, um, I did want to also bring up at this point that um, organizations and individuals that submit are eligible for one or the other program proposal or success story. Uh, so we do, and, and honestly, it's one of the pieces that, that um, is important for the length that the, the challenge is open. We want you to be uh, concise and thoughtful about your approach to this. Um, so um, please submit one or the other, either a success story or a program proposal. So now we'll get into the evaluation criteria. Um, for the deck and the slides that will be sent out, uh, the Evaluation criteria are broken out here by success story and uh, program proposal. Uh, that said, for today's webinar, uh, I'm only going to go through one side because they are exactly the same except uh, for future tense and past tense uh, in the writing. Um, so looking at community assessment, um, this is 20%. So this is any Qualifi qualifying and quantitative data you can provide uh, to provide a characteristic, show the characteristics of the community. Um, and then why addressing postpartum mental health has been a priority in that community. Um, the partnership piece. So this, I believe, is your team building in the next one. Yep. Um, so how how your organization or how you as an individual brought together partners to address postpartum mental health, any evidence that you can provide for that partnership. Uh, the logic model of how the program works to improve postpartum mental health. How does it actually improve? Um, what are the pieces that you can measure uh, or that were measured from the start that show that impact? Uh, because that's what ARC is really driving for here is is meaningful success in these communities. And then evidence of meeting the programmatic goals, um, the, what the programmatic goals were, and the metrics that demonstrate that the program has worked, the measurability again. 
Okay. And then the last um, <clears throat> scored piece is the uh, the capacity to disseminate. Um, so your document and or your video um, tell a clear and compelling story. If you submit a video, it should have captions. Um, and then virality. So this is this is a pass fail. Um, so again, you'll want to use that definition, and we will provide that when the slides go out. Uh, and then that you clearly state that you are a success story or a program uh, proposal category, which um, is very easy to do because it's in the form uh, when you submit your solution, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so again, the program proposal evaluation criteria are the same. Uh, I did want to call out this partnership piece uh, because it, it's a little bit different between the partnerships for the success story and the team uh, for the program proposal. So describe how you bring together traditional and non-traditional partners um, and evidence that the partnership, uh, that partner support, support for partnership is provided. So this is again for the program proposal where your letters of support can come into play in your appendix. Uh, to show for this piece. Okay. And then the same with the evaluation metrics, uh, virality and category identification. So at this time, I'm going to get into just how you submit. Uh, so when you go to our website and uh, review the all, of, all of the information about the challenge, um, and then you're ready to submit. There's a how to enter challenge page. Uh, it'll bring you to the challenge platform uh, where you can read about the challenge and then you'll click join challenge. You have the ability to join as an individual or a team. Um, a team just means that you are, there are other users on the platform that you want to form together. You can submit as an individual, but that can be as an entity uh, if just one person is actually going to be doing the submission process. Uh, that may be easier for you. Um, so if you don't have an account, you can create one as soon as you get onto the site. Uh, you can use social media and other uh, sites logins to log into our secure platform. When you are ready, uh, you can submit your solution. So you see here the second step. And then you'll come to this page, which is the form. So you'll enter a name for your solution. Uh, and then the submission type. So this is a pass fail where you um, choose whether you're entering for a success story or for a program proposal. Um, if you have a video, please enter the URL so it should be posted somewhere. Um, and you can post it privately. Uh, YouTube and Vimeo have to upload a video to make uh, so that only uh, folks with the link can access the video if you want to host it privately and then just enter that link and feel better. Upload your solution files. You can upload files for your submission. So, for instance, uh, for the program proposal, if you have a your narrative, which is five pages or less, and then you have your appendices of your uh, letters of support, you can enter them all into here before you click submit. And then once you submit, you'll see your submission with the date and time. Uh, you can withdraw that submission if you'd like. Um, you can also replace or you can upload a new submission. ARC will take, if you have multiple submissions, let's say you have multiple versions uh, between now and the deadline of September 15th, uh, ARC will take the most recent version. Uh, so just make sure uh, when it comes time for the challenge to close that the most recent version is the version that you would like considered for the challenge. Okay. And with that, we will now go to questions. Um, and at the bottom there, you see the email address. At any time during the open submission period, please submit questions. Uh, we will be maintaining a frequently asked questions page um, with any questions we get here today. And um, and we'll be posting those and updating those on the website. Um, so the first question actually came in through the chat and it's 
if a success story occurred in both urban and rural areas, is this eligible? I will turn to Priscilla. I will say that my assumption, Priscilla, is so if a success story occurred in both urban and rural areas, is this eligible? If it occurred in a rural area, then technically it's eligible. Uh, I assume that the impact on the rural area, though, is what is measured um, as success for the purposes of this challenge. Is that right, Priscilla? I think that's an accurate interpretation for the, for the if it's a, uh the description of the area impacted would focus on the rural part. Okay. Um, and so another question is, um, is there a distinction between a rural area and an area where there is a lack of maternal mental health services available? Priscilla, do you want to take that? So the eligibility criteria are on our website, and I believe that what we have established is the ground rules is that it must be a rural area as uh, defined by the HRSA criteria. The link, the link to determine whether or not the community is within the areas that HRSA defines as rural is on our website. Correct. So there may, I mean, there, there, may, there is very likely a lack of maternal and mental health services available in um, densely populated urban areas. Um, but for the purposes of this challenge, the focus is on rural mental health. Okay. Um, so another question, will the slides be available separately from the recording? Um, yes, the, the recording will be made available as well and as will the slides. So they will be separate posts, separate links on the ARC website. You will not need to view the recording just to see the slides again. The slides will be posted as a PDF. Uh, the next question, does a budget need to be submitted and is F&A F &A allowed? So Priscilla, I'd like to pass this one to you. No, that does not need to be submitted. This is being used as a challenge competition under the Competes Act. So under the Competes Act, the government is able to directly pay prizes to people who provide uh, innovation, meaningful innovation. And uh, across the government, this has been used to address a wide variety of different needs and opportunities. So for the people who uh, get the success story uh, prize, you get the success story prize. You don't need to send us, you know, for a success story, there's nothing to be budgeted for. For the program proposal, um, because this is a challenge and not a grant, um, you simply would get the prize. And then there's none of the normal sort of grant requirements for reporting afterwards. I do want to call out one other question that was uh, brought up earlier through the chat, and that was about the screening tools, Priscilla, and um, whether they are open for public use or with permission, and if there's a cost for those for use. Someone else responded in the chat um, that they are open and available. I'll just go back to that slide real quick. Um, that they are open and available. You can look them up. Um, but I, I wanted to see if there was anything you wanted to add about the accessibility of the screening tools, Priscilla. I included the list of screening tools here for information purposes. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Um, um, what, with, what with the, folks can, okay. Sorry. I guess what I would add on to that is with the use of screening tools and clinical practices, there's a number of things that uh, a service provider would need to consider. And um, thinking about electronic health records, some electronic re health records have a specific tool built in. Um, other people would be looking, uh, based on their circumstances, it might be easier for them to use pen or pencil and paper, like a score sheet. However, I am simply listing here the ones that have 
been psychometrically tested and validated and that are commonly used. Okay. Yeah, I think we're looking to see just if they if they wanted to use any of them, if there was going to be a cost for them. Uh, but I think that they should have access to all of them. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know if they're in the public domain, but um, certainly people could uh, do additional investigation, but this is just provided here as a way to get people um, started on what the actual screening tools are that are commonly used. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question, is this a limited submission, meaning one per university, or could there be multiple submissions, such as different submissions from various colleges within the university? It's my understanding, correct me, Priscilla, that there, if there are multiple submissions, as long as they are of different topics, different teams, or um, at least different topics, um, it's it's allowed that there can be multiple from an organization, correct? So how I understand the question is that from the federal government perspective, like in a state university system, each location of a state university is considered an autonomous legal entity. Um, sometimes it depends on how the state administers the university system. Um, but let's say, for example, I don't, I don't want to pick anyone out of the hat, but just popping into mind, let's say University of Texas at Houston, that's legally a separate entity from uh, any University of Texas at, at um, Austin. So as long as they're separate legal entities, both uh, separate legal entities within a system could submit a, a either a success story or a program proposal, but not both. Okay, thank you. So the next question, uh, this individual works as a peer certified peer support specialist in addictive disease, providing some peer support to pregnant women and postpartum mothers with substance use disorder. Uh, they've unintentionally noticed a correlation of mothers with postpartum depression as well as barriers they face to getting support. The program did not begin with addressing postpartum, uh, but has become an integrated part. Would this be something that could allow us to qualify for this opportunity? I, I would say it, it's very hard for us to make an assessment um, at this point. I would say, you know, reviewing this, those review criteria, the evaluation criteria uh, for both the success story and the program proposal, whichever you feel best fit. If you feel that you have uh, substantial content to, to show um, and by all means please submit uh, within the, the bounds of the submission requirements um, and, and best of luck um, for sure. Uh, so the next question uh, is about the link to the HRSA eligibility on the grant website. Uh, so the, I believe you're referring to the rural um, the rurality codes, those will be provided in a link when these slides go out, and we will also add them to the FAQ page um, on the challenge website, on ARC's challenge website. Okay. Does the submission require the signature of an institutional authorized application? No, it does not. Uh, this is not a grant application. We're looking for your good ideas when it comes to the program proposal. We're looking for uh, the great stories of success of the work that you've done. Um, <clears throat> so it does not require uh, an institutional or authorizing official signature. Okay. And if you register for the challenge as an individual, can you add members to your team later? Yes, as long as it is before. The deadline, uh, you absolutely can add members of your team at a later point. Um, that being said, uh, the platform team uh, has no bearing on the team that is considered in your submission. I hope I can make that clear. If you submit as an individual and your five-page submission 
lists all of your team members. Those members are considered a part of your team because they were a part of your narrative. Uh, the team function on the challenge platform is just a way for you to uh, collaborate and participate in the platform together. Again, it has no bearing on your submission as a team. Okay, uh, there are no other, oh, here we go, here's another question. So this sounds like it's a limited submission with a, within a legal entity. So a college of nursing and a school of medicine that are both a part of the single university with a single tax ID could not both submit an application. Is that correct, Priscilla? That is a great question. I actually think that based on the question and what I'm understanding, it sounds to me like the College of Nursing and the School of Medicine could separately submit as long as they were unique success stories. So let's say that the School of Medicine did uh, an activity in County A and the School of Nursing did an activity in rural area B each uh, the College of Nursing and the School of Medicine could both submit, but it couldn't either there could be one submission if the program was done jointly. So let's say some of the people who did the, the program are in the College of Nursing and some are in medicine, that would be one submission. Or if they did the programs or projects separately, where the College of Nursing did a project, the College of Nursing would send their submission. And if separately the School of Medicine did their own project or program, they would send their own submission. So um, thank you for bringing up this question. It's an important one. I think that really what we're getting at is not trying to ring the system by double entering the same activity, project, or program twice. Right, right. And, it, and yep, as long as those ideas are distinct. Um, in our process of posting these questions, posting the slides and the recording, we'll do a little bit further research just to make sure uh, that the answer is as concrete as possible for you. Um, but yes, again, thanks for clarifying that. Okay. So at this time, we have no other open questions. Um, we will just leave it open for a few more minutes, um, give folks time. Uh, we have seven minutes left in the hour. Um, if folks have other questions, uh, feel free to, to drop them into the Q&A pod. Okay, at this time, uh, there's just five minutes left. Uh, we haven't received no additional questions. Uh, Priscilla, was there anything you wanted to say to, um, to close us out? So nothing additional for me. I really want to thank everyone for joining us today and for your interest in this challenge. 
And we look forward to working with you and hearing about your ideas. If there are any additional questions that come to you after the event, uh, you can always send us an email at the email that's listed here on this slide. We are currently planning to have another webinar on June 30th in case um, people would like to join us again to um, hear more about uh, expert advisors or any other topic that you might have on your mind related to this challenge. Excellent. At this time, that concludes the webinar for today uh, for the web, for the ARC challenge. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and look forward to those posts coming up for recording in the slides. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.